Oké, okay, goedemiddag allemaal. Ik heb de eer en het genoegen om aan een select groepje toehoorders wat uitleg te geven over, over de onderzoeksgroep. Het wordt opgenomen, dus ik, ik ga het in het Engels doen, omdat dan de opname ook een beetje ruimer uh, verspreid kan worden. Ik moest dat nu storen, mijn excuses, maar dus de reden is dat het, dat het gebruikt gaat worden. So I'll switch to English. The idea of the, of the, of the presentation is this, to give a short overview of, of the research we're doing in the group, Physics and Chemistry of Nanostructures. We're in the Department of Inorganic and Physical Chemistry. And my name, by the way, is, uh, is the Seger Hens. I did not, let's say, assemble a kind of detailed overview of every topic we are, we are, we are addressing. I will just look at with you at, at a few case studies that, that give, in my view, quite a nice introduction and quite a nice impression of, of what we're doing. But before that, let's just give you a brief overview of the talk. So I'll start with, with a kind of short introduction uh, to the materials we're working with, that's, that's nanocrystals, tell you what it is, why it's useful, what it, what it has to do with nanotechnology. The name of the group, remember, is Physics and Chemistry of Nanostructures, so we work a bit in between the chemistry and the physics. And so during the talk, I will gradually shift from the chemistry, I will start with that, to the physical chemistry, and finally we'll end with the physics. And in the, at the very end, if I have time left, I will address a bit the road to, to applications. What, what are the applications of the materials that we developed? But as a start, brief introduction, what are nanocrystals? Very basic picture you get here. It's a, it's a transmission electron microscopy image, so we kind of look through such a nanocrystal with an, with an electron beam. You see a whole range of, of, of bright spots, and every spot that you get there is actually a column of atoms. So with this electron microscope, we have the resolution to resolve these different atoms, and we see them as a kind of columns because we're just looking through this crystal. And so if you draw two lines like that, for instance, the distance between these lines, that's just the lattice parameter of this crystal. It's a lattice selenide crystal, the lattice parameter there is three angstroms, and you can just count how many lattice planes you have. There are about 15 lattice planes, so we're looking at a crystal that is about, say, four or five nanometer in size, a collection of, let's say, 500 atoms altogether. And a nice point of, of these nanocrystals, or that is actually what it is, so we have a collection of maybe a few hundreds of atoms, but they already have, and that's important, they already have the crystal structure of the bulk material. But they're, of course, very, very small. And in the case of lead selenide, it's the rock salt crystal structure. And so what you actually see is the projection of this crystal on this 100 top surface through this electron beam. Now, what do these nanocrystals have to do with, with nanotechnology? Let's say in general, that there's two ways to make nanostructures materials. And the first one, that's the method that was developed in microelectronics. They changed their name. They call themselves now nanoelectronics. And what they actually do there is they start from very big silicon wafers. And they use lithography to remove bits and pieces of the silicon. And in that way, they can build very well-defined nanostructures devices, nanostructure devices, like here a transistor, for instance. And this is called a kind of top-down approach. You start from a big silicon wafer, you remove bits and pieces, and you end up with a nanostructure. It's a bit like an artist, a sculpturist would make a sculpture by removing bits and pieces of stone to get his, to get his statue. Why are people doing this? But well, it's very nicely represented by, by Moore's law. That's something that everybody knows. It's the evolution of the number of transistors on a chip, the number of uh, other gigabits you can store per surface area. So the basic idea by making components, by making devices smaller and smaller, is that you can do more things, more computations, you can store more data with less material and everything becomes much more efficient. And if you look at the pros and cons of the approach, of this top-down approach, a very important thing is that with these lithography-based methods, you can make very complex structures. That, just look at the transistor we have there. It's a pretty complex structure that can be made in a very reproducible manner. You can make billions and billions of, of them, and they're all the same, and it's very reliable. There's a few drawbacks, on the other hand, and that is that first of all, this nanometer scale, if you remember, this nanocrystal was just four or five nanometers across. This nanometer scale is not really accessible with these lithography-based methods. The second thing is that it's quite expensive. I mean, you just have to look at this fab to imagine how much the, or how high the investment cost is to install that. Now, an alternative with which you can, in the end, make similar nanostructures is to start from individual building blocks. And instead of removing matter, you will assemble bits and pieces together to create, hopefully in the same way, a kind of structure. And that's where these nanocrystals come into play. 
And it actually works at two levels. First of all, we use just chemicals, precursors as building blocks to build nanocrystals. And for that, we use chemistry and we assemble lead and selenium precursors into a lead selenide nanocrystal. In a second stage, you again can see these nanocrystals as building blocks and assemble them in a kind of, what you see there is a kind of two-dimensional crystal of crystals. And you can do self-assembly where actually the nanocrystals themselves are the building blocks. And that way you can also create larger materials that are structured at a nanoscale. There's a number of important advantages. That's first of all that this nanometer scale is quite easily accessible. We start from precursors that are just atoms or molecules. We use chemistry. I mean the nanometer is just a scale of chemistry. Second, if you look at this chemical or this, this, this reaction flask compared to the fab of the, of the semiconductor technology, you see that it's much more cheaper, of course. And it's also pretty versatile. I mean, we're not limited to silicon. We can apply this to a whole lot of materials. An important drawback, of course, if you think of this, this, this transistor you, you've shown on the previous slides, is that it's not that straightforward to make very complex structures in this way. It takes a lot of self-assembly to create a complex structure. So that's limitations, of course. I stressed a few times this, this nanometer scale. Why, why is this important? Well, I'll show you a slide. And if you go to, to training sessions of how to teach, they learn you not to show such type of slide. It's a lot of text. But it, it will appear very gently, very slowly. The idea is that you read it together with me. There it comes. And we're almost there. So this comes from this talk of, of Feynman. There's plenty of room at the bottom. There's a few important elements in there. He's talking about what happens if you, if you go really down to this nanoscale, do, down to dimensions of just a few atoms. What he says is that if you go down to that scale, matter will follow not just the normal laws of physics that we know in macroscopic. Uh, for macroscopic materials, but they will follow the laws of quantum mechanics. Consequence of that is, if you think of the semiconductor industry, I mean, what they're doing is actually they're just making the same thing ever smaller and smaller and smaller. But in the end, it remains the same transistor. If you go to this nanoscale, where new laws start to, deter start to determine the properties of matter, what you can do is, or what you can expect is that you can do things not just smaller, but the same thing, but that you can do things in a different way because your material will have different properties and you can make use of that. And for instance, one of the different properties of, or one of the properties that you get, we will talk about that a few times, is that matter will have quantized energy levels, just as atoms or molecules have. So we have kind of intermediate range and that's where these nanocrystals are, where we still have, for instance, the crystal structure of the bulk material, but the electronic properties it already resemble quite closely those of individual atoms and molecules, like, for instance, these quantized energy levels. Okay, how do we make these nanocrystals? Let's go to an example. We use what is called colloidal synthesis. So the end result of this synthesis, it's a kind of dispersion. You should think of just a liquid, a solvent. And in there, we will have dispersed all these colloidal small nanocrystals, nanoparticles. I'll give you, I'll show you a movie that, that shows the synthesis of cathelorite nanocrystals. And just before we, we start looking at the movie, a few uh, remarks. So if we want to make cathelorite, we need a precursor for the cadmium. We need a precursor for the tellurium. So it takes, we make certain choices there. We will also add surfactants. We will understand their role later on. And obviously, it's a solution in, in, in a solvent, so we need a solvent. And typically, we use here apolar solvents, and so we adjust our precursors that they are soluble in this apolar solvent. How does it look like? It's a kind of movie here. I will hope that it works. Yes, there is the button. There's some music to it, so you can enjoy that. But before we listen to the music, just a brief explanation. So what you see here is a kind of three-neck flask. So in here is the solvent, and already in there as well is the cadmium precursor and also the surfactant. Then you have three necks. When it's used, you have here a thermocouple. So this is used to set and control the temperature. Here you have the top neck. There is a connection to a Schlenk line. So the whole synthesis is done under, under inert conditions, under nitrogen atmosphere. And here you see the pin of a needle. We will use this to inject the tellurium precursor. And upon injection, this will initiate the formation of the nanocrystals. So let's enjoy the music. If I can start it again. Yes, 
can do that. And so at a certain point there will be the injection. There it is, and immediately this solution turns from just transparent to yellow. This is the initial formation of the nanocrystals. And as the reaction proceeds, you see that slowly the color changes. It was yellow in the beginning, which means that you only absorb blue light. Now it's already orange, meaning that the solution starts to absorb also green light. It's slowly turning into red, so we're also absorbing the yellow light. And in the end, we will speed up the movie in a minute. You will see that the solution is black, which indicates that you actually absorb the entire visible spectrum. So as these nanocrystals grow, the color change, and it actually has to do with the absorption onset that shifts gradually to the red. We'll come back to that later on. And then the reaction is stopped just by reducing its temperature. That's done here by a water bath. And during the reaction, at, some at specific times, we have taken aliquots. And at the end of the movie, you see these aliquots. At the left, it's just in, in transmission. You see their light absorption. Again, this color shift, yellow at the right, the smallest nanocrystals, towards the red at, at the right, the largest nanocrystals. Here, you have the same nanocrystals, but under UV illumination. And what you get there is the luminescent light of these particles. And again, you have this color shift. The smallest particles emit in the green. The largest particles emit in the red. We'll turn to that later on. But let's first go to the chemistry or continue a little bit with the chemistry. So we have these vials, it's liquid, it's solutions, typical solvents are a toluene, chloroform, apolar stuff. And in there, if we could zoom, if we could magnify that, we have all these tiny nanocrystals. And I plot them as a kind of yellow circle, let's say a yellow dot, and then we have these little molecules around that, and that's the surfactant. So the idea of the surfactant is actually that they absorb on the surface of these nanocrystal, and they are there to prevent all these particles to aggregate. We want separate nanocrystals, we don't just want one big chunk of material, we want separate particles. And that's the role of these surfactants. And if you think in terms of categories, you have here the inorganic core, that's what we see with the TEM as well, and this actually determines the physical properties of these materials. Typical dimensions, 2 to 20 nanometer, and then this core is surrounded by these ligands, by these surfactants, and they form a kind of shell around this nanocrystal. Typically we use their pretty long chained carboxylic acids, for instance, or phosphonic acids, so typical length there is a few nanometers. And one thing I would like to focus on now, it's a kind of case study, it's work that we did mainly together with a group of uh, Jose Martes, who is somewhere here, I saw him entering, yes, <laughs> thanks Jose. Uh, because what we did is actually we used NMR, I mean if we have to Jose Martens, it's about NMR, we actually used NMR to, to identify, to quantify, to study, to do some signs with these ligands. And the first thing I would like to show you is just the NMR spectrum of cat cell light quantum dots, before that, a number of basic materials, material properties. So here you get again a TEM image. It's a bit zoomed out. We don't see the atoms here. The spots, the dark spots that you see is just individual nanocrystals. You can see they have a size of something like 3.5 nanometer. Here is a size histogram. We have a size dispersion of about 8%. Something that is quite important actually for later on. I've mentioned these particles, they have the crystal structure of the bulk material. If you think of bulk at selenite, I mean, you have for every selenium in there, you should have one cadmium in there. If you do the ratio, or if you measure the ratio of the cadmium over the selenium in these nanocrystals, you find that they're not stoichiometric. And typically they contain considerably more cations than anions. And the ratio in the case of cationite here is something like 1.2, 1.3. Here we mentioned 1.23. Before we dig into that ratio, let's first take a look at this NMR spectrum. You have a kind of frequency axis. The importance of the frequency axis is that you can split or you can separate between different protons by their resonance frequency. But I will not go into details about that. The most important thing is that you have actually two types of peaks, two types of resonances here. And as one said, that actually has sharp resonances. We have one here, we have one there, and we have the one there. And next to that, you have a collection of pretty broad resonances. One here, the two, is almost invisible. We have a whole lot of labeling here, and we already know that these broad ligands are actually from the bound surfactants. 
The question is, how can we be sure about that? And then there's a pretty nice NMR technique that we have used, and this is called dozy NMR. And what you do there, instead of a kind of 1D representation, intensity versus frequency, in dozy, you have the same frequency axis, but at the same time, you determine the diffusion coefficient of the different species. And so you introduce a kind of second dimension. What you see here is that these very narrow resonances, they all have, remember this is a logarithmic scale, so what we plot is a log the logarithm of the diffusion coefficient, minus 8.5 there, minus 10.5 there. So the top here, that is very small diffusion coefficients, and the bottom, that's the high diffusion coefficients. What we see is that the narrow resonances, they all come with a very small, sorry, a very large diffusion coefficient. And that's actually toluene. It's a small molecule moving quite quickly in solution. All these broad resonances, on the other hand, they have a diffusion coefficient that is about 20 to 30 times smaller than these small molecules, which means that the object is moving 20 to 30 times slower in solution. And also, I mean, you can link a size to the diffusion coefficient. It's when over. So the objects here, the broad resonances, they come from an object that is 20, 30 times bigger than such a toluene molecule. That's the 5 to 10 nanometers of the nanocrystal. So the resonances we're looking at here are actually molecules bound to this nanocrystal and they move together with this nanocrystal in solution. And so using this dose, we can really pinpoint all the, bound, all the resonances of bound ligands in this spectrum. And you can do much more. I mean, if you do NMR in a quantitative way, the surface area under the resonances tells you how much protons you have. So we can actually just count the number of ligands. And this gives us quantities that are actually quite useful, which is in this case, for instance, the ligand density, the number of ligands per nanometer square of nanocrystal area. This is nice. I mean, this is just the dispersions like we synthesize them. In science, I mean, you learn more things by, by giving your sample a kind of kick, by disturbing it. The way we disturb it here was by adding extra excess of these ligands. And so next to the bound ligands, we will now have some ligands more in this version. And we focus on one of the residences of these uh, oleic acid ligands we have on the surface because it's very much isolated from all the rest. What you see, we have here a ratio. This is the excess over what we originally had. And we're increasing it from red to blue. What you see, if you add excess acid next to this broad bump we already had, we create a kind of second resonance. And the more we have excess acid, the more this resonance shifts towards a kind of limiting value. This black line, that's what you expect for just a free oleic acid. So if we add extra acid, we get a kind of new resonance, but it's not a constant. If we add more excess acid, this resonance is kind of shifting through the spectrum. You can, do, you can analyze the same experiment using dozy. You can measure the diffusion coefficient, and what you see in those is that you get two diffusion coefficients. You get one from the ligands we already have or had, and there's a new diffusion coefficient of the excess acids. And here is the same thing. If we increase the amount of excess, we see that the diffusion coefficient changes from the bound value gradually to the free value. But it's not from the very beginning free. And this is something you can interpret in terms of exchange. What is happening here is if we add excess acid, that it's actually exchanging with the ligands that are already on the nanocrystal. And the fact that we see two resonances actually points towards a kind of two-step process. We have the original bound ligands. These are in blue. That's the broad resonance. And then the red ligand that we have here, that's the excess. And we have a kind of exchange process where, first of all, the excess can kind of fizzy soap in this ligand shell. And this is a very fast exchange. And this leads to the additional resonance with a kind of intermediate diffusion coefficient. Why intermediate? Part of the time this ligand is free, part of the time it's in the ligand shell. And the more you have free ligand, the more your results will evolve towards the free values. And then there is a second step, that is that we can also, there is a chemical sorption, so we can remove an existing ligand, we can replace it by a new one. So there's a physics sorption step, the first one, and a chemical sorption step, the second one. And this is actually quite a nice observation, because by doing this, we can figure out what the bond is between this ligand, between this acid and the nanocrystal. In principle, there's two possibilities. 
I mean, this acid could just be bound to the nanocrystal as an acid with its carboxylic acid proton present, or it could be bound as an oleate, as an anionic species that has lost its proton. If you think in terms of this exchange, what you see if you have this excess acid there and you exchange it from one that is originally bound, then you will recover protons that were initially next to the surface, you will recover them in solution. In this situation, you will not get any protons from the surface. And we can tell the difference between both by doing this exchange not with protonated, where is my pointer? There it is. Not with protonated acids, but with deuterated acids. The point is, you don't see deut deuterium in the NMR spectrum. So if we don't have protons present on the surface, that's the first scenario, we will also not see them after the exchange. While if we have protons present on the surface, they will appear after the exchange. Here's the result of the measurements. Here, left, is a kind of reference spectrum. You just have, again, the bound oleic acid, all the broad peaks. That's the starting material we had. It's a very pure sample. You just see the broad peaks, and here the peak of the solvent, which is toluene. It's important. There's no contaminations. Here, the middle panel, you see a kind of blank experiment where we used protonated acids. So you have, for instance, for every resonance, like here, you have the satellite of the, of the excess peak. And this is the resonance we're interested in. These are the carboxylic acid protons. And then the black curve that you have there, I always lose a, there it is. The black curve you have there, that's what we get if you do the exchange with the deuterated acid. You will say, okay, you see a little bit of protons there coming up. The problem is we have to make this deuterated acid ourselves. So it's never perfectly pure. The nice thing is we can use NMR to determine the purity. And so we can actually calculate, depending on either scenario A or scenario B, given the purity of the deuterated acid, how intense this signal should be. And that's shown in the third panel, where the black line is again the measurement, the dark gray background. That's what we expect for the scenario where the oleate is on the surface and the light gray background is what we expect for the scenario with the acid on the surface, given the purity of the deuterated uh, oleic acid. You see, we are very close to this scenario B. And actually, the fact that we are just a little bit above, I mean, we can only lose. As soon as we have some water contamination, we will get these protons. So the fact that we are so close indicates that we know what the bond is. We don't have an oleic acid on this surface. We actually have an oleate species on this surface. And then we can do our bookkeeping. I mean, we know the diameter of the particle. We know this cadmium over selenium ratio, which was something like 1.23. If you know the diameter, you can just count how many cadmiums and how many seleniums you have in this nanocrystal. And what we have with this excess ratio is that we have about 80 cadmium cations in excess. 80 cadmium cations more than we have selenium. We know the surface density of the ligands. 4.6 per nanometer square. If we have the diameter, we also have the surface area. So we can just calculate how many ligands we have for a single nanocrystal. And then you can do the stoichiometry. And you see that you have for every cadmium in excess, you just have two ligands. Which is not illogical because a cadmium will be two plus and such a single oleate will be one minus. So the whole thing actually adds up to make a nanocrystal that is completely neutral as a whole. And there's no charge on this nanocrystal. And so what you see is actually that these nanocrystals, they're a kind of organic, inorganic hybrid particles, where the properties of the core, the excess of cations, actually will determine how many organic ligands you have around. There's no coincidence there. They have a very well-defined stoichiometry, because the overall particle has to be neutral. That's the chemistry. Let's move to some, well, 
maybe a last question. We were actually the first to do this, this let's say, the, this counting of ligands and excess. It has become a kind of standard. Huh? It has been recovered not just by ole oleates, but also by phosphonates. Also, if you go to small inorganic ligands, such as chlorides, also thiolates, they all give the same conclusion. The number of ligands that you have is actually such that you just balance a charge on the cations. And it's a very generic picture. It has become a very generic picture of these non-stoichiometric nanocrystals. Let's go to some physical chemistry. I will be very short in there. I just need it at the end of my talk. It's a way that we use to assemble these different nanocrystals in, into monolayers. And we use here Langer Blodgett deposition. It just means we have a trough. The blue thing that you see, it's water. With their hydrophobic ligands, these particles will float on water and you can make monolayers of that. And you comp can compress this film and you can actually extract the substrate and transfer this film to a substrate. If you do this transfer to a TEM grid, this is again an electron microscopy image, you see that you get actually a very nice packing of these nanocrystals over, over a surface area. And this can be done really over square centimeters. We'll come back to that later on. It also shows how you can start to process these nanocrystals. This is work we did together with Christophe de Tavernier, where we worked with these langer blodgett films on, on a substrate, and then you can use atomic layer deposition, ALD, to overgrow such a layer of quantum dots by, for instance, a metal oxide. And in this way, you can actually go to a kind of material where you have, that's shown here, that's the black line here, where you have these nanocrystals embedded as a kind of thin film, a monolayer, inside a solid matrix. And that's the way we work on, on the processing of these materials. Something that is important there is, I mentioned here, if you do this, ALD under the right conditions, we can preserve the quantum dot properties. What do we mean with that? Quantum dot properties is mainly optical properties. We've seen light absorption, we've seen light emission, and it has to do with the way electrons behave in these nanocrystals. What does physics, physics tell us about electrons? Well, if we take a very simple picture, we have a metal, Silver, for instance, silver is a conductor. It conducts electricity because you have three electrons in there. And classical mechanics will tell you that such an electron is a bit like a football. It has, for instance, a well-defined position. It also has a well-defined speed. But actually, we know that this is not correct. We know already that for 100 years. If we take the point of view of quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics will tell us that we have to look at this electron as a kind of wave with a certain wavelength and also with certain energy. And okay, the amplitude is, is, is a measure for the probability to find the electron in a certain point in space. If an electron is a wave, it means that we should look at this chunk of silver. Not, it's, it's not a football field with footballs, but it's rather something like a guitar string or the tube of an organ which also can contain elastic waves or support elastic wave or sound waves. In the very same way, this bar of silver supports electron waves. And if you now shrink your box, and that's what we do if you work with a nanocrystal, we will put electrons in a box that we will make ever and ever and ever smaller. Now the point is, this electron, it cannot escape from this box. If you think of this wave as showing the probability to find the electron somewhere, it means that the wave function of this electron has to vanish at the boundaries of the box because it cannot leave the box. And the end result is that the wavelength of this electron, half a wavelength should fit the diameter of the box or the full wavelength should fit the diameter of the box but you cannot have three wavelengths and a half, or you cannot have a tenth of a wavelength. Just like if you think of a guitar, you also have standing waves there. And the pitch of the sound that you get is determined by the dimensions of the guitar string or the organ tube. That sets the frequencies because of the boundary conditions. The nanocrystal works in very much the same way. So if we reduce the wavelengths of the electron by reducing the size of the nanocrystal wavelength is linked to energy we will also raise the energy of the electrons inside this nanocrystal and this actually determines the way this nanocrystal interacts with light i mean we translate that in a picture where we have energy levels in this nanocrystal 
and a number of electron energy levels are filled with electrons and this is up to this level so we look here at the highest occupied level and then you have the first unoccupied level the resonances we're, we're talking about is actually transitions between these energy levels and you can make an upward transition by absorbing light and if you have the electron returning to its ground state the particle will emit light and so if we shrink the dimensions of the box here we will make this energy difference larger it means that the wavelengths of light that are absorbed will shrink will get shorter and also the wavelengths of light that are emitted will get shorter so smaller particles emit shorter wavelength light larger particles emit larger wavelength light and that's what we've seen just after synthesis. It's the same picture here. We have big cat selenite nanocrystals there. We have small cat selenite nanocrystals there. And if you illuminate them with UV light, you see that the emission color changes from red all the way to blue. This is actually what Feynman was talking about. I mean, just by changing the dimensions of the material, it's all the same material, but just by changing their dimensions, we can change their properties. And we can make the same material emit either in the red or we can make it emit in the blue and for, in a, at every color in between of course i will not talk so much about emission anymore i will shift to something actually the opposite from emission which is something we worked quite hard on the last years and that is light absorption by quantum dots but it's going to be the same thing i mean you also have this blue shift if you make the particles smaller Let's take a look at the absorption spectrum, typically look like this. So what we plot here is a kind of what we call intrinsic absorption coefficient. What's the meaning of that? Think of a thin film of quantum dots. If you invert this number, it's more or less the film thickness that you need to absorb all the light. And so a number 10 to the 4 here means in a film of 1 micron, I will absorb all the light with this wavelength, for instance. We get here this absorption coefficient as a function of wavelength or energy. I use the photon energy here. You see two things. I mean, the first thing is here, the different curves are for differently sized particles. This is what we have been talking about. This is the nanocrystal with its discrete energy levels and you have a photon coming in and you can absorb light, you can transfer the electron to a higher energy state. The peak that you have here corresponds to that transition for smaller and smaller and smaller particles. So the smaller the particle, the more this peak is shifted to the blue. And so absorption across the band gap is size dependent. That's also the color change you saw in synthesis. Right? It's this absorption onset there. The particles grow bigger there, so it shifts to the red. Second thing that you see is that at high energies, when you go from somewhere a level here to a level somewhere up there along this energy axis that the high energies all these curves coincide and there's no difference between a big particle and a small particle anymore how can we understand that the second thing i shouldn't do show a formula but still i do it this is an expression we use to understand this absorption coefficient i will not explain very much where it comes from but the important thing is that it contains two parts and the first part I see the pointer is actually losing power, but I also have circles around it. The first part, this is what you would expect for the bulk material. For a homogeneous material, that is not very small spherical crystals in a solvent. The second part is a correction term, because the reason we have this correction term is that we work with small particles. It's called a local field correction. The basic point is, shown here, we have light, which is an optical electric field and we have the nanocrystal. What we show here is the external electric field of the optical of the light. It's a color scale that gives you the field intensity. And what you see is we have a field intensity on our scale somewhere here for the incoming light. This is a driving field, right? If you look inside the particle, again, you have a homogeneous field, but its intensity is considerably lower. So this particle is kind of screening the electric field field cannot really penetrate the particle. What is important for the absorbance is of course this local field driving the absorption. So we need this correction factor if we want to calculate absorption coefficients. Now the problem with this formula is that it kind of promises more than it can deliver. 
You see there is a quantity in here that is this epsilon, and there is my pointer again, is this epsilon, and this actually depends on the quantum dots, and we don't know that number. Something we do know is this epsilon for the corresponding bulk material. And so we can use this formula to calculate the kind of reference value. The absorbance we would have if this small nanocrystal were just a bulk material. And that's the black line on the curve. And so you see where we have these quenization effects, there's a clear difference between the bulk material and the nanocrystal. This is this confinement of the electron, the change of the energy levels. But if you go to shorter and shorter wavelengths, higher and higher energies, all this confinement actually doesn't matter anymore. And this very small nanocrystal actually behaves just like the bulk material. The reason I tell this, first of all, I mean, it's been a very nice collaboration with a lot of colleagues from the faculty. It's, I mean, for all the colleagues, it's actually their, highly cited, their most highly cited paper. So that's actually quite nice. This has had a lot of impact. But the reason I tell it in this presentation is that last year, we could kind of go one step further. And that's something I would like to show you. And I have a few minutes left, so we'll do that. We return to these, to these monolayers. So we're not looking at quantum dots. I mean, before we were lo looking at quantum dots in solution dispersed, which means in terms of absorption, you're looking at just the sum of the absorption of the individual quantum dots. With this langmuir blodgett technology or technique, Remember, we can make monolayers, closed packed layers of quantum dots, and we can make them over pretty large areas. I mean, there you get an AFM image, but we also have microscopy images. They're homogeneous over square centimeters, which means they're large enough to just put in an absorption spectrometer. So we can measure the absorbance easily of such a single monolayer. But the nice thing is, by the TM images, we know how many particles we have. So we can actually recalculate this absorbance by dividing it through the number of particles. I mean, we just have to count them by dividing it through the number of particles. We get the absorbance of light by an individual quantum dot in such a film. And that's a number, it's this sigma, we call it the absorption cross-section. It's a number we can compare with what we have in solution. And that's what we did. So we look at the ratio absorbance, absorption cross-section of a single quantum dot in a film and of the same quantum dot in solution. And then something amazing happens. I mean, we plot here, it's the same thing for lead selenide, cat selenide, quantum dots, again, cat sunlight quantum dots. Let's first look at the graph here at the left. What we change is the diameter of the quantum dots. We have different measurements for different sizes. The vertical axis gives this ratio. And what you see is that when you assemble them in a film, the very same quantum dot will absorb two times, three times, up to five times more light than when it's just in solution. And this is something that apparently depends also on their diameter. There's a kind of optimum diameter. In the case of lead sulfide, this is 4 nanometers. In the case of cat satellite, you see the same thing. Packed in a film, they become stronger absorbers. Again, an optimum, in this case, somewhere around 6 to 7 nanometers. In the last graph, what we did is we changed the distance between the particles in the film. And again, we find that depending on how closely packed they are, they will absorb more or less light. Now, this observation by itself is something unique. For me, the most amazing thing are the full lines. This is a model prediction. It's not even a fitting. I mean, we don't use a lot of fitting parameters here. It's a model prediction of how we understand this absorption enhancement. And you see that the model actually fits or corresponds, it's not a fit, corresponds very well to the measurements. Let's take a look at how this works. I replace all the quantum dots, so all the small spots that you see, that's the quantum dots. And we have light, I mean, we look at light absorption, so we have light coming in from the top with its electric field in the plane of the quantum dots. These, these, these dots, I mean, it's a crystal, it's composed of positive and negative charges, Light 
it is an electric field, it means that you will push away the positive charges, you will attract the negative charges, you will create a dipole in there. So all these quantum dots, they will be polarized by the field. Remember what we said, if we want to understand light absorption, what matters is not so much the electric field of the light that you apply, that you shine on the dots, it's the local field that determines what is happening. And here, if you take a look at the local field, there's actually two contributions. If we zoom or if we focus on this blue quantum dot in the center, there will be the field of the light, that's one thing. It will also experience the field of all its neighbors because they become polarized, they're dipoles, they also have a field that will oscillate at the same frequency as the light does. And so if we want to express the field driving a single dot, this blue end for instance, we have the optical field, that's the first E term, and then we have the contribution from the neighbors. There's a number of terms there that are not so important. This dipole that you create will of course depend on the material you have at hand, and that determines this alpha O. The S tells you something about the influence of the distance between the dots. Because if the distance is larger, this field will be smaller, etc. So there's a material term there, and there's a kind of configuration term in there. If you reorganize this, it's about the last formula I will sh show, you get an expression for the local field in terms of the applied field. And you don't need a lot of mathematics to see what will happen here. I mean, you have a denominator that is one minus something. So if the something is one, this local field will get incredibly high even for a very small driving field. You have a resonance here. And if we plot this, you see that you will have a local field exceeding the applied field in a certain range of this alpha OS over epsilon host term. And that's exactly what is happening here. We are working under conditions, sizes, combination of sizes of dots and packing of the dots that make this denominator smaller than one. And so the local field is actually larger than the applied field. And these dots, they all help each other to absorb more light. So we're looking at a kind of collective effect where the sum of the different parts is not the same as what the whole assembly is absorbing. Actually, the assembly can absorb more light than the, individual, than the dots individually can do. So here in quantum dot monolayers, they help each other to absorb more light. And so in general, you can say that you have here an example where all the assemblies actually have properties that are different. In this case, it's more performant than the individual building blocks together. Like I was afraid, I have to skip the applications. Just brief overview, why is this interesting for applications? Why would people be interested in these nanocrystals? Well, first of all, you have here materials with tunable chemical properties. You can change the surface chemistry, if you like. You can tune the chemical properties. You can tune the physical chemical properties. And you can tune the physical properties, for instance, by changing their size. Second thing is, and that's actually quite important, I mean, remember, we have these particles just in a solution. That means that you can use all kinds of very cheap, versatile, solution-based processing methods like printing, spin coating, whatsoever, to deposit these particles. So in general, it makes them very well suited for functionalization, for making materials, composite materials, with a very well-defined functionality. When last slide, I would like to show, I will not talk much about it, but here is one big problem that we face. A whole lot of things I've been talking about, also the picture that you see there, it's based on cat selenite. I use here just a, a copy from Wikipedia, from the Dutch Wikipedia, and you see that, I mean, it's mentioned there, you don't have to have much imagination for that. It's pretty harmful, I mean, it's actually restricted. You have this ROHS restriction by Europe use of cadmium is actually forbidden. And so one of the important challenges of the field is to work towards replacements, to find other semiconductors that do the same job. And that's something we actually start, have started working on from, from a month ago. Okay, brings me to my conclusions. I will leave them as they are and my acknowledgements. PCN Group, collaborations within UGENT, International Network and the funding.